This is Indiana in the Morning, presented by First Commonwealth Bank on the Voice of Indiana County, WCCS, AM 1160 and 101.1 FM. And it's time now for our interview segment, presented by Marcus and Mack, a law firm representing injured people. Indiana University of Pennsylvania is getting ready for the theatrical season, as Theater by the Grove will kick off the 2020-2021 season with Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, but it's going to be presented a little bit differently than it has been in the past. Joining us is Dr. Richard Kemp, who is the director of the show for this year. Dr. Kemp, thank you very much for joining us on Indiana in the Morning. I'm excited about this because this is Shakespeare, and it's something I know a little bit about, and I'm excited for well, first of all, thank you very much for having me, and uh, I'm excited too, and I'm very glad to hear other people are excited about it. Uh, one of the things that we do in our Shakespeare productions is to make them as accessible as possible for people who might not be familiar with the language. So the, definitely one of the things that you're trying to do is to kind of break it down a little bit, I guess we can say, and make it not as intimidating, because when people think of Shakespeare I think a lot of theater goers may get intimidated by the fact that this is the flowery language of of Shakespeare's time, and they might get a little in- intimidated by that. I would think. Yeah, and uh, often audiences have an expectation, but um, funnily enough, uh, although the language may seem very archaic, there are very few words there that are actually different from modern words. Sometimes the grammatical structures are slightly different, but one of the things that we do is in working with the students who are performing the play is to help them really clarify the phrasing and the meaning of the language so that it comes across clearly. And in this play, we have one of the archetypal comedies uh, of the of Shakespeare's works, and it's uh, it's a wonderful romantic comedy um, with two characters, Benedict and Beatrice, who are continually trading insults with one another, and of course that what's called that merry war of words mm-hmm. hides their affection for one another. But you also have uh, the two who are in love with each other, Claudio and Hero, and they kind of represent the other end of that spectrum. The two are just constantly in love with each other. That's right. And interestingly enough, the play starts with uh, troops returning home from war, and Claudio is one of those. And he's realized while he's away at war that um, his feelings for Hero are such that he wants to marry her. And um, this would all go smoothly because uh, they have no difficulty in expressing their love for one another, except for the villain of the piece, who's known as Don John, who just out of sheer spite wants to disrupt their marriage. And in order to do that, he sets up a scene uh, where Don Pedro, who is uh, Don John's commander in the army, sees what he what appears to be um, a transgression, if you like, on the part of Hero. Mm-hmm. And when seeing that and at night, he uh, imagines that um, she's not a suitable uh, bride for Claudia, and Claudia thinks the same. And then they do an awful thing, which is to arrive at the wedding itself, and uh, Claudio rejects Hero at the altar, and uh, that's one of the most powerful scenes in Shakespeare. We've seen Shakespeare uh, comedies, especially, set in very different times and very different places. I will admit, I did a Shakespeare play when I was 13 (laughs) years old, and that was A Midsummer Night's Dream for the Indiana Players, presented, it was directed by Nancy Martin, and Mm -hmm. it was, uh, I I played Puck in that production, but we set it in the Amazon jungle. Which I, which I thought was a really neat idea because we were dealing with Hippolyta, the Queen of the Amazons. I've seen Twelfth Night set in 1920s New York, which I thought was a really cool way of presenting it. That was done by a production company in Pittsburgh. What's the setting going to be for Much Ado? Well, with this play, we've reimagined it as a 1940s radio play. So what the audience will see is a radio studio 
with the actors at microphones. And this is both an aesthetic choice, but also a pragmatic one, because, of course, during rehearsal and performance, we have to keep the performers distance uh, as because of the uh, mitigation measures for, right. for COVID-19. And so we decided to try and make a, a performance virtue out of that constraint, if you like. And uh, the actors you see are people who uh, appear to be in the 1940s, and of course that fits very well with the um, initial part of the play where troops are return returning home from war and where, uh, in setting it in spring, early summer of 1945, when you have troops returning home, mm -hmm. um, so there's a nice uh, link up, if you like, between the the play structure and that particular period, and then the idea of putting it in a radio studio, as I said, allows us to keep the actors distance from one another, and means that we've been able to rehearse the play and we'll be able to perform it. So this performance, which will be live streamed on the internet, you're going to see every actor on stage as if you were sitting in the audience, right? That's exactly right, yeah. And we're working with the comm media department at the university whose uh, live streaming is of a very high quality. They're used to doing sports games. They show the uh, football games, the baseball games, uh, and their equipment allows them to switch very rapidly between different shots of, uh, in this case, different actors. And, um, in fact, we'll be rehearsing with them this evening uh, and having a look at what the live stream, how the live stream comes across, and then uh, talking about how we'll uh, refine that and perfect that for the first live stream that goes out to the public on Thursday evening. Is it difficult to think about it from that regard, from now from, a t from what maybe, I guess you could call it a TV standpoint rather than a full stage standpoint now that you have the, uh, the cameras in there and they're going to record this? Yes, you're right. It is challenging, certainly, because um, obviously we're, we're used to working on stage and there are very different techniques of acting required for stage acting and screen acting. So one of the things that I've been working with the actors on is the, what we call the size of their performance, because often what you have to do on stage is big. It has to be big vocally. It has to be big gesturally and facially and so on. And mm, bringing that down so that we're seeing the sort of psychological impulses that are driving the language, uh, and they're not um, overly played for what you'll see on screen. Mm -hmm, definitely. I've actually seen some uh, theatrical productions that have gone to a live stream format where the actors were kind of restricted to their own six square, six feet, six foot box, if you will. So again, you had mentioned that you've been trying to direct it uh, through using the microphone as kind of the area where the actors are going to interact and be socially distanced with one another. Was that also a challenge for you, trying to come up with this uh, format to keep everybody safe? Well, it was, yeah. We had um, we had plenty of discussions amongst ourselves. And when I say we, I'm talking about the whole production team involved in the production that includes both students and faculty members. And um, obviously, as the various different measures were introduced and then changed and then relaxed and so on, uh, we had to find a format which would work for all potential situations. And so the idea of having the actors at microphones obviously is justified by the fact that the show is set in a radio studio. And um, it was one that we came up with early on as our sort of uh, fallback scenario, if you like, and then uh, with the actors at the microphones, they're distanced from one another. And then, of course, when we change scenes, some actors leave one microphone and uh, exit the stage, and other actors come on and take over the microphones and so on. And we have them all doing this in wonderful costumes of mm -hmm. the 1940s. So uh, some of your listeners may uh, get a sense of nostalgia from the costumes and also from the music that we're using, which is all period music. Mm -hmm. I would also imagine with it being being an old-time radio studio, sound effects would also come into play. Exactly, and um, as I'm sure you're aware, 
uh, sound effects in the 1940s weren't uh, digital as they are now. And we had what were called Foley artists who would create the sound effects live on stage or in the studio. And so we're having a lot of fun with that, with a uh, Foley artist with, for example, a pair of shoes and a tray of gravel to create the sound of uh, feet walking away and um, creating thuds and thumps, bird whistles and crickets and so on. And it's, uh, it's actually quite a lot of fun to see how that was done back in the 1940s. That's a whole art form in and of itself, creating sound effects like that live for radio microphones to pick up. All right, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. You said that the shows are going to be uh, Thursday and what other day? You said Thursday and Saturday? That is Thursday and Saturday. You're right. And uh-huh. they'll both be at 730 and people who want to watch the show can get tickets by going to www.iup.edu slash livelyarts slash events. And if that's too much to recall, if one just puts lively arts in the search function on the IUP webpage, it'll pop up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have tickets priced at $20 for group viewing. So if there's a household or family that wants to watch it together, it'll only cost $20. $20. It's $10 for a single ticket. So um, what happens when you purchase the tickets is that you get a streaming code which you then enter into the website of the platform that's doing the live streaming. Mm -hmm. And And we, sorry, beg your pardon, and we have uh, a ticket hotline and the number there is 724-357-1313. And that's open Monday to Friday from 12 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. All right. So people can log on to iup.edu slash livelyarts slash events. Yep. Or they can call 724-357-1313 if they want to get tickets to this live streaming event, which sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm certainly hoping it will be. And I hope it will be, too. Uh, Thank you very much once again for joining us here on Indiana in the Morning, Dr. Kemp. And we wish you, actually, I won't say it that way. I'll say to your cast and crew, break a leg. Ah, you know the tradition. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you very much again. Dr. Richard Kemp joining us this morning on Indiana in the Morning. IEP's Theater by the Grove production of William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, Thursday and Saturday, 7.30 p.m., live streaming. More information, iep.edu slash livelyarts slash events slash events.